Princess Renner's genius may be up there alongside Albedo and Demiurge, but even she's no match for the Thousand Year Foresight of Vines. Sure, her planning was definitely useful in the demise of the kingdom, but absolutely nothing could have prepared her for the genius play Ainz made at the end of it. What I mean is that the way Ainz had personally taken part in the facade Renner concocted was a brilliant move that ensured she'd be trapped forever. It was a minor yet massive play that completely eliminated any sort of leeway Renner had prepared for herself. So, as we recount the destruction that befell the kingdom, as well as the final moments before its ruin, the core cut content belongs to Renner and the plans she used to make it happen. I'll also specify exactly what she did to make herself a demon, since it's only ever hinted at and not explicitly said. But first, I guess a lot of you really like Isekai and collecting waifus since Fantasia is back again to sponsor another video. For those of you that don't already know, it's a beautifully designed city builder that has you start a new life in a medieval world of fantasy. One where you'll assemble a team to manage your kingdom, level them up to inspire and recruit more followers, then use them to acquire resources, gain power, and expand your conquest. Where Refantasia really shines though is the numerous ways in which it'll make you more cultured. Like, I'm talking romantic encounters with almost every waifu that you could possibly imagine. Whether it's elves, demons, goddesses, or slimes, there's a vast selection to create your harem out of, all of which are intricately designed as well as there to interact and create love stories with. Then, once you produce some heirs with the ones you've chosen, you can then use them to foster alliances with other nations, a core gameplay aspect that has you establish ties through an expansive web of marriages. Combine that with the incorporation of operations, war, and economy, and what do you get is a simple yet enticing game of strategy. So, if you're interested in exploring this harem-focused world of fantasy, then feel free to use the link in the description or my QR code to download Refantasia Charm and Conquer today. Not only is it completely free, but it's also super helpful in supporting the channel. Plus, you can use my code for special rewards. But now, let's get back to the video. Episode 52, The Witch of the Fallen Kingdom, covering the last half of Chapter 4 of Volume 14. Before we start things off with Mare, there was a little bit about Aura that needs to be said first, specifically regarding the numerous familiars she brought with her. There was the Idis Tyrannos Basilius, the wolf-like magical beast Fenrir, the similarly inspired Hound of the Wild Hunt, the dragon-like quadruped Kirin, the winged snake hybrid Amphisbena, then the serpentine lizard Basilisk. And with all possessing levels between 70 and 80, the one that stood back and remained separated from the rest was the much lower leveled Toad of Greed. He was the single monster that didn't pile on Idis for using her Howl of Fear. But unlike how we saw in the anime, Idis wasn't so lucky as to get away with just a scolding. You see, this screeching howl which caused the soldier's instant death was quite the annoying scream to those who possessed psychic resistance against it. So, when many of the other familiars were hit with such a noise, they immediately attacked Idis for being such a nuisance. It was a barrage of kicks and charges that Idis simply couldn't defend against. Normally her size and power would have allowed her to defeat each monster individually, but because all of them were attacking from each and every direction, that made defending herself practically impossible. The only thing she could do was cry out in hopes that Aura would help her. It was after that little conflict was resolved that Aura would speed over to the Wizard's Guild, then proceed to make slight work out of Vesture and his disciples. What we didn't get to see after was the detailed information Aura was given from the Kingdom's collaborator. It was a basic floor plan that narrowed down where the kingdom's magic items could have been located. We don't really know what these magic items are, but one of them was confirmed to be the demon summoning item Ainz had given to Demiurge back in Season 2. They were items from the New World that Ainz wanted to do research on. Moving on to Mare's scene next, and the main cause for his concern wasn't the prospect of killing mostly women and children, but instead the conundrum that came from doing so without a single survivor. Remember, up until now, Mare had only been fighting men who wanted to fight back. They were much less likely to run away, and the villages they were protecting were significantly smaller. But now that the target was larger and filled with people who would likely run, that made the objective exponentially harder. There was no guaranteed method that would ensure both the city's destruction and the death of everyone. A fact that was all too clear from the practice Mare had gotten before this. You see, it was as he made his way to the capital that Ainz ensured Mare would gain experience with this very mission. By having him destroy every village on the way here, not only would he understand just how complex and difficult it was, but he would also be more prepared when figuring out how to approach the much larger capital. That's why he knew none of the methods he had used before would work on the massive population he was currently faced with here. 
Sure, he could just cast a lot of spells and reduce the city to rubble, but doing that would most certainly leave room for survivors. That being the case, this was actually quite the tricky mission for Marmaday. As a slippery slope that could easily spiral out of control, the core thing he needed to avoid was alerting the populace. How could he destroy one portion of the city without having another look outside and realize what was happening? That was the key question which would determine his success here. If he could keep the general population the exact way they were now, then killing everyone becomes a whole lot easier. One wrong move though, and a whole bunch of extra steps then become necessary in order to correct it. So, as a Guardian who took pride in being the strongest AoE caster in Nazarek, Mare truly wanted to live up to the standards his creator had left for him. He couldn't bear the thought of failing just like how he did with the first village he tried destroying. Luckily for him though, Eins had been there with him to teach him a valuable lesson. He had said that whenever you know you're lacking in experience, the only thing you need to do is work hard and get better at it. It was a crucial teaching that made Mare realize he just needed to practice more. If he could destroy more villages and slaughter more people, then surely he'd be able to become the creation Bukubuku Chagama wanted him to be. Thus his renewed passion for destroying the capital here. Now, when we switch over to climb in the castle, there was actually a small number of knights who stayed behind to defend everyone. Not because they thought they could make a difference, but instead because their loyalty was something that they valued deeply. As soldiers knighted by the king himself, they weren't about to abandon their sworn duty just because defeat was imminent. No. This was an act of devotion that finally made Clem realize why they hated him so much. He never did understand why the noble knights thought of him as such an outcast, but after seeing just how strong their feelings to the royal family was, he finally came to realize that a peasant like him could never belong with them. If a peasant was to come up and stand alongside them, then that would only diminish the value of the titles that they held so much pride in. There was no place for a peasant to be anywhere near royalty. So, despite Clime wanting to stand guard beside these last few knights, his duty to the princess superseded everything else, leading him to wait in the corridors until she was ready. It was while he did that his final thoughts of Brain showcased just how important he was to him. Not only did he far surpass Gossip as a friend, but Brain was actually coming quite close to the same level of importance the princess was at. It was an intimate friendship the anime unfortunately didn't have time to develop. Fast forward now to after Clem had hidden the kingdom's artifacts, and that's when he would come across Mare. A dark elf he felt that maybe he could win against, but decided against it when thinking about all the unwanted attention it would bring. Like, if he was to start a fight against this supposed little girl, then there was no doubt the noise from it would attract all the undead nearby. So, even if he did somehow win this battle against Mare, the journey back would just lead the undead straight to Renner, resulting in the best option right now being to just run away. One of the things that really stuck out to him as he was running back though was that, despite large portions of the city being seen burning in the distance, not a single scream could be heard throughout the entire capital. There was this ominous silence that didn't match the destruction that was happening all around him. When Clym did finally return to the castle, there was an interesting line said by one of the Frost Virgins which further reinforced the idea that Renner had already transformed herself into a demon. The first hint was when she'd swung Razor Edge without a problem, then the second was her ability to run the halls while holding it without any sign of fatigue whatsoever. Both were subtle clues that sorta hinted towards what she'd become, but neither were as blunt as the Frost Virgin telling Clime he was the only human remaining. Now, the horrid sight awaiting him on the inside of the throne room was the final evil Clime would allow this Sorcerer King to commit. He would face him here no matter the danger, and do all he could to buy Renner whatever few extra seconds of life he could afford. Of course, he knew this Sorcerer King was far more powerful than he could ever be, but he never imagined that he would be this much more powerful. A single exchange was all that was needed for Clime to feel like an ant staring into the sky above him. He was quick to realize Eins was far beyond a level that could even be fathomed by humans. But even with that insurmountable gap right in front of him, Clime's courage was boosted by the princess stationed behind him. The girl who had saved his life, given it meaning and made him human, was the only thing pushing him forward against this immovable object. It was a sentiment Eins noticed had granted him the same eyes that Gossip once possessed. Ones that could only convey insurmountable determination. Of course, this being the series that it is, Clime's futile attempt to do anything at all was amounted to nothing just like everything else not from Nazarek. So, where that brings us to now is the final reveal of Renner's involvement from the very beginning. Before we get to that though, it's important you know how exactly it is Renner had to become a demon in the first place. 
I'm sure you're aware she used the Fallen Seed to do it, but what you may not know is the sacrifice required to activate it. One of the only ways the seed inside will reveal itself to the user is by first accepting a number of lives as preparation. Only after a reasonable sacrifice has been made will this seed make itself accessible and allow the user to make the race change it so desires. So, what Renner had sacrificed to open her fallen seed was the numerous orphans and caretakers she was housing at the orphanage. Remember, it was back in episode 12 that we saw her graciously making food for everyone in the orphanage. What we didn't get to see prior, though, was the poison she had added to make sure everyone who ate it would die. That's why we see Renner encourage the caretakers to eat it too, along with the seemingly out-of-place thank you that Renner had given Albedo for the poison. Both these were once again subtle clues hinting towards what Renner did to become a demon. Now, when Klyma awoke to find his world turned upside down, despite a swirl of emotions clouding his judgement, the fact remained that he still belonged to Renner. So, even if she was now a demon of an enemy nation, there was no hesitation in joining her because every part of his being was already hers to begin with. So, after Clime accepted his fate and pledged loyalty to Nazarick, there was quite a bit more to the next scene with Renner and Albedo. Specifically some insight into the situation Renner had placed herself into. One of the main things that she was rather concerned about was the more serious tone in which Albedo had started conversing with her. It wasn't a noticeable change to the average person, but to a brilliant mind like hers it was all but apparent. Not only did Albedo stress the word worthy when emphasizing how Nazarick respects talent, but she also seemed off when talking about how Ainz was praising her efforts. It was this slight shift in tone from her usual warm demeanor that really spoke volumes towards how Albedo now viewed her. They were these subtle tells that assured Renner she wasn't as safe as she'd thought she'd be. Sure, she had proved her worth this time, but in order to maintain her position as a denizen of Nazarick, Renner knew she would have to continue to prove herself. A point I'll continue talking about in just a moment. A minor thing about Clime that they had quickly discussed first, though, was the fact that Renner refused to let him be healed all the way. It was actually quite easy for Pistonia to use her magic and hasten his recovery, but Renner instead insisted for the absolute minimum. She had asked for just enough so that he could regain his consciousness. Then, one other thing that Albedo wanted to make clear was that by no means was Clime their hostage. He wasn't a tool intended to make Renner stay loyal, but instead a gesture of good faith that showed they believed in her value as an asset to them. It was Albedo's way of saying she was only here because of her worth. They didn't bring a human into Nazarick because they thought they could trust her, but instead because she had proved herself valuable. That alone was the only reason Clime and herself could continue to stay here. That being the case, should she ever not meet the expectations that they currently had for her, then Renner couldn't even imagine the types of punishment that awaited her. It was only natural considering the types of monsters she was making a deal with. What made this whole situation even more daunting though was the fact that Nazarick had forced her to set herself up like this. By dealing with an outsider who was supposedly as brilliant as their best, Albedo and Demiurge weren't so naive as to bring her in without caution. They didn't explicitly say that this is what they did, but the way they had allowed Renner into Nazarick was one that was only possible after she had willingly supplied them with several of her weaknesses. They had let her in with no way to oppose them back, all while still having her provide a leash that they could use to handle her like a dog. Unless she provided something that they could use against her, then this gesture of trust wouldn't have even been possible to begin with. That's why Albedo had Renner tell her all about how important Climb was to her. It wasn't because she was interested in him, but instead because this was part of the process of them placing a collar on her. They wanted to ensure Clime truly was the precious pet that she made him out to be, the core weakness they could use to verify Renner's loyalty to them. Now, while this was something Renner had accounted for, what she didn't expect was the appearance of Ainz as the actor in the finale. You see, Renner had assumed it would just be Albedo facing off against Clime here. Never once did she imagine that Ainz himself would do it. But because Ainz was the one who did, the price for doing so was far more than she was willing to pay for it. Reason being that the role of beating Climb was one that could have been played by literally anyone. It was a simple jester's part in which the person who was responsible would have no choice but to act the way that Renner had designed for it. So, by having Ainz take the role himself, she was basically having him dance in a farce of her own invention. She had made Ainz stoop to a level that no one had ever done before. And that was something that definitely didn't sit well with Albedo. 
it didn't matter how brilliant Renner was to them, because to have Ainz debase himself in such a trivial matter was an act of disrespect that clearly changed Albedo's opinion of her. It didn't matter whether it was unintentional or not, because the fact it happened was more than enough to justify Albedo's anger. So, despite Renner having hoped that she could get away with leaving some leeway to prove herself more, Ainz stepping in had all but removed that. Any hope of holding back a bit was no longer possible. Should she show even the slightest bit of incompetence, then there wasn't a doubt in her mind that Albedo would eliminate her. And that was all because Ainz had stepped in and played a role he shouldn't have. It was a brilliant play in which Renner could only contemplate in astonishment. As a move that backed her into a corner without any hope for escape, Renner could only assume that this was Ainz's plan all along. To her, she believed he knew that she was planning to hold back, and as a way to counter that, he made Albedo become even more strict than she was before. It was a truly masterful maneuver befitting someone of unfathomable intelligence. Now, what we saw with the following dance was a literal interpretation of the feelings Renner had possessed here. You see, the sheer amount of bliss that came with achieving her dream was a wave of emotion strong enough to make her dance. She was ready to give voice to it and burst into song. Thus, the actual song and dance we got in the anime. Aside from that, there were a few things worth mentioning from the epilogue, but the most important was the extremely graphic demise the novel gave Philip and his people. Compared to the watered-down version we got in the anime, we truly did miss out on what could have been one of the most satisfying scenes in Overlord. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but I will be including it in my special episode dedicated to Philip. A recount of his unbeatable crane wing formation, along with the gruesome demise that befell him after. Then, last but not least, is a brief moment from the epilogue highlighting exactly how Ainz perceives this new addition to Nazarick. Sure, she may be brilliant in the eyes of Albedo and Demiurge, but to him she was nothing but, and I quote, a batshit crazy girl named Renner. As an outsider with no connection to Yggdrasil whatsoever, the fact she could very well be a genius like the others truly scared Ainz since she could potentially start to see right through him. It was a thought that made him doubt he could maintain his act as an absolute ruler. So, with this potential threat now looming within the walls of Nazarick, Ainz wanted nothing more than to just run away. Perhaps he could leave and go on a vacation of sorts, maybe even bring the twins since they'd been working so hard. But yeah, that's pretty much it for Overlord Season 4. This may be the final episode in the anime, but I've still got quite a few videos for this left in the pipeline. So, along with Danmachi and maybe Shadow of Eminence, I'll continue to sprinkle in Overlord videos at least up until January. Until then though, as always thank you so much for watching and if you enjoyed this type of anime content then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!